them, that's what they call me As technology and computers revolutionized themselves at the turn of the 21st century, so did black hat wearing hackers. No hacker of this era has a tale more enthralling, more topsy-turvy, and more morally divisive than that of Ukrainian tech whiz Maxim Popov. After voluntarily turning himself over to the authorities and picturing a free life in America as a security expert, the FBI blindsided him. Then, following years of collaboration, jail time, and FBI success stories, Maxim threw a curveball of his own, taking an innocent agent down in the process. His targets bled millions, and his schemes were so widespread and intricate that even the top detectives remained fooled. Turns out that this mole was never really a mole. As a youngster growing up in the Ukrainian city of Zytomyr, two hours west of Kiev, it didn't take long before Maxim Popov was finding his feet in the computer world. He'd mastered the technical basics by using the school computers. While Americans were learning on the IBM XT, Maxim was developing his skills on a Kiev-based company clone called the Poisk One. He was obsessed with cyberpunk fiction and rewatched the 1995 movie Hackers with Angelina Jolie more times than he could count. Through his teenage years, Maxim's mantra became obvious. He was going to be a computer hacker, and he was planning to make a lot of money while doing so. It wasn't until Maxim's father bought him his very own PC as a 15-year-old that he could put his fascination and vision into practice. Legitimate tech jobs were few and far between, while computer-savvy young programmers were aplenty. This imbalance led to hordes of young hackers, with Maxim Popov at the core. While not the most technically talented hacker out there by any means, Maxim combined the skills he did master with a social edge. He had an insatiable talent for manipulating people. His first target? Stolen credit card numbers. He would call up American cell phone and computer retailers, put on a near-perfect accent, and then direct the companies to cash out the accounts directly to him. This worked like a charm for a while. However, retailers eventually saw a pattern emerge with Eastern European shipping addresses, so the opportunities dried up. From there, it was a transition into the extortion game. Working with a crew, Maxim would break into well-known American-based companies' digital frameworks, steal their data, and then approach them with an offering. Credit card data from 38,000 customers of eMoney, a former electronic payment provider, now sat in Maxim's pocket. Then, another 16,000 dossiers of personal information were ransacked from Western Union. With this data at his disposal, Maxim contacted the companies and offered to put a stop to the intrusions and destroy the stolen information, on one condition. They hire him as their security consultant, which typically came with fees of anywhere between 50000 and 500000 American dollars. E-Money didn't just sit back and allow themselves to be taken advantage of. They were secretly in contact with the FBI while the whole ordeal was going down, and were stringing Maxim along as the authorities added to their pile of investigative material. Meanwhile, tensions in Zeitermer were rising, as was the threat of violence. So Maxim formed a bold idea – to move to America, turn himself in to the FBI voluntarily, take a slap on the wrist as punishment, and work in tandem with the authorities as a computer security expert, rather than work against them. Then he could transition into his own internet startup company and bring in the big bucks. He'd been in contact with the American authorities up to this point, and they were on board, coming across as friendly and cooperative. He did get on the plane to the U.S., and he did intend to work with the FBI, but they had other ideas. As soon as he set foot on American soil, it was clear that the arrangement had been altered, and there was nothing that Maxim, an admitted criminal, could do. The FBI threw Maxim into a small isolation room. They presented a choice. Option A, Maxim could become an FBI informant, working around the clock to lure his former criminal partners into a sticky FBI trap. Or option B, Maxim could go to jail. Without much wiggle room, he cooperated with the FBI over the next 24 hours in a test environment. They instructed him to talk to his friends in Russian online chat rooms while the FBI monitored every message. However, Max was only pretending to cooperate. In reality, he was interweaving Russian colloquialisms into his messages to warn his associates that he was now an American government mole. Three months later, the translations made their way onto the desks of the FBI agents, who quickly realized that they this time had been played for fools. Maxim was taken out of his safe house and thrown into a small county jail to face charges for his past cybercrimes. While all of this was taking place, computer hacking in the wider world was only increasing. The volume of spam and phishing emails was increasing. Credit card fraud was escalating. 
2001 served as a key turning point with the debut of a hacking website called Carter Planet. Not only was this ominous underground property a thieves' paradise for buying and selling stolen credit card numbers, passwords, bank account details, and identities, and as this site gained notoriety, it caught the eye of an up-and-coming FBI computer crimes agent from the Santa Ana, California office, Ernest E.J. Hilbert. Agent Hilbert was well aware that having a native Russian speaker and experienced cyber thief on his side could be the masterstroke that could unravel this entire website and bring in far more seasoned cyber criminals. So in order to sway Popov to join FBI's so-called intelligence gathering mission, Hilbert needed to do two things. One, assure him that this time the FBI was not intending for Popov to rat on his friends. And two, he needed to stroke Popov's ego saying things like, <clears throat> I truly respect your skill set. Those factors was enough to get the Ukrainian on board. As much as Maxim detested the idea of working for the FBI, it was a sight for sore eyes compared to the inside of a jail cell. Every day, Hilbert and another agent would collect Popov, keep him shackled and handcuffed as they led him to their car, and then drove to a nearby office building decked out with desks and a handful of Windows computers and a Cyrillic keyboard. This routine soon became known as Operation Ant City during which Popov, who now had a new digital identity, would hang out in underground European chat rooms and post about Carter Planet. In the eyes of the digital underworld, this guy was a big-time Ukrainian scammer who wanted nothing more than stolen credit cards and lots of them. Popov's first scalp was a mysterious Ukrainian hacker known only as Script. The pair spoke online, eventually agreeing on a deal. This mystery hacker named Dennis Pinhaus, who was actually Maxim Popov working with the FBI, would buy $400 worth of stolen credit card numbers from Script, and Script would send them to California. But by mailing the contraband out of the Ukraine onto U.S. soil, Script committed a federal crime in U.S. jurisdiction, which helped persuade Ukrainian police to arrest him. In February of 2003, Data Processing International, or DPI for short, was hacked leaving the information of 8 million credit cards exposed. As Popov searched for answers into the DPI hacking, he came across a 21-year-old Russian student called RES. RES claimed that he knew the three hackers responsible and was willing to negotiate a deal. So Popov kept digging. He offered to buy all 8 million cards for $200,000. However, up until this point, he'd only made small purchases, and RES didn't believe for a second that Popov actually had $200,000 in his bank account. Fortunately, Agent Hilbert came up with a solution. He, Popov, and an entourage of FBI agents were shuttled to a nearby bank that had agreed to cooperate with the scheme. In a hidden back room, bank staff brought out $200,000 in $100 bills from the vault and placed it on a table. With cameras rolling, Popov rifled through the wads of cash and explained in phrases in Russian which translated into things like, look, I'm showing you the dough and I'm showing it to you at point-blank range. The video worked like a charm. Popov knew that all Eastern European hackers really wanted was a job. As a thank you gesture for completing the deal, Popov directed RES to apply for a company that Popov allegedly worked for, which was fake and set up by the FBI, of course. RES applied using his real name. And just like that, the FBI had all it needed. In total, the operation had removed 400,000 stolen credit cards from the black market and alerted over 700 companies that they'd been breached by Eastern European hackers, adding up to millions of dollars worth of foiled scams. Throughout all of these ploys, Popov and Agent Hilbert developed a rather strong bond. On one Thanksgiving day, rather than spend another 10 hours solving cybercrimes, Hilbert surprised his hacker with a projector, a Lord of the Rings DVD, and a complete Thanksgiving meal. They trusted one another. After eight months behind bars and working on Operation Ant City, Popov was released. The FBI rented him a place on the beach in Santa Ana, but he couldn't adjust to life in suburban California. So a judge granted him permission to visit Ukraine, provided that he returned to California shortly after to serve out the remainder of his supervised release. Agent Hilbert drove Popov to the airport and said goodbye, knowing full well that he wouldn't see the cunning hacker again. Taking advantage of the strong relationship that the pair had formed, Popov began feeding Hilbert a steady stream of tips on the basis of good faith while back in Ukraine. One of these tips led Hilbert to a Russian hacker gang called X.25. This group had hacked companies like AT&T, but also hacked the FBI itself. Thanks to Popov's help, Agent Hilbert had found the man responsible, an engineering student in St. Petersburg named Leonid Edel Sokolov. Hilbert got Sokolov to admit the wrongdoings, but then it fell apart in an instant. In reality, these good faith tips were part of a larger plan, a black hat plan. 
Popov was working together with X.25 and Sokolov. X.25 would hack, and then Maxim would come in and save the day. For a hefty fee at the company's expense, of course. All while throwing around the FBI agent Hilbert's name as someone who could vouch for his credibility. In essence, Popov was now sabotaging the FBI from the inside. For the AT&T job alone, Maxim Popov was asking for $150,000. Back in the U.S., Hilbert was under investigation on suspicion of conspiracy, fraud against the government, and leaking confidential law enforcement information. At the end of this roller coaster, Maxim Popov still views Hilbert as a friend, saying, quote, He was the only friend I had. I'm still a black hat, and I never changed. But who cares? I still love him. End quote. Can you... Like... Yeah!